All right. How's everybody doing this morning? Yeah? All right, cool. Uh, I've got some slides, but I think Brett said we could talk until like 10 a.m., so we'll have time for Q&A too, so not too worried about it. Uh, if we can bring up the, uh, the presentation on the deck. So thank you everybody for coming. I know like day one is not as hard to get up at 9 a.m. Day two is a little harder to get up at 9 a.m. when you're in Las Vegas, so I appreciate everybody coming here. I was uh, making my slides and I realized the same thing. I realized the very first PubCon that I went to was uh, London and Boston in 2003. And it was a little bit smaller then. Uh, great set of folks. But, uh, you know, I found a few pictures. Uh, Brett didn't always wear a suit. And Pub didn't always stand for publishers, by the way. And uh, that's a little weird. That's what I looked like 10 years ago. Uh, that was before all the spammers gave me gray hair, so. All right, but you guys want to hear about what's going on with Google, what's the future, you know, what direction is Google moving in? And one of the best ways to do that is to look at where we've gone. So I want to talk about the state of the index for a few minutes and talk a little bit about the moves that Google's done so that you can predict where is Google going to go in the future. So we've actually doubled down on a lot of what I call moonshot changes. So these are changes that, you know, Larry Page, Larry Page says, think big, like think of the impossible. So the knowledge graph. That's not just taking Wikipedia and making it into something pretty. It's actually trying to understand the entities, the people, the stuff that's really in the world. So my office mate, Ahmed Singhal, calls this things, not strings. So instead of just matching keywords, you really know what's behind a query. So York, New York, New York Times, Times Square, knowing what the difference is between all those and not just matching up the individual keywords. We've also gotten a lot better at voice search. I thought about trying to do a demo of that today, and I was like, okay, live mic, reverb, inside a Faraday cage, inside basically a bunker, uh, probably the, the odds are not good that that'll work well. But if you haven't tried it, voice search is getting better and better. Conversational search sounds like voice search, but it's actually the ability to do queries over a session. So think pronouns. I'll show you an example of that in just a second. Google Now. Sometimes you don't even think to do a query. Sometimes it would be really nice if Google would tell you, hey, you've got a meeting at 10 a.m. It's over at the Bellagio. The traffic's pretty bad. You better leave now if you want to make it to your meeting. So it's, it's looking for that space where people aren't even thinking to necessarily do those queries yet. And one of the biggest changes we've been starting to do is something called deep learning. It's basically like these neural networks that people did in the 1980s, except it's multiple layers of neural networks, and it's using thousands of computers to try to improve what you can learn. And the stuff that it can learn is pretty crazy amazing. So let me show you just one example. If you take a word and you boil it down into a thousand dimensional space, so you make it a vector where it's a series of a thousand numbers, and you make every word into this thousand dimensional vector space, the relationships between those words actually tell you something about the semantic meaning of those words. So for example, given China and Beijing, you can say, okay, this word China is here in the space, this word here, Beijing, is here in the space, and the difference between those actually encodes something meaningful. It kind of encodes what is the capital of. And so if you take another uh, country like Russia or Turkey, and you apply that same delta, that same vector, you get Moscow or you get Ankara. It doesn't just work for like capitals of countries, it works for all kinds of things. This is a paper that Jeff Dean, who's one of our uh, senior fellows, in fact, he used to be a Google fellow, which was level 10 on the career ladder, and then they made him a senior fellow, so his level actually goes up to 11. Like, these guys have worked on deep learning where they try to figure out what are the relationships between words. So, the first row of this is just like France is to Paris, as Italy is to Rome, or Japan is to Tokyo. But it starts to get smarter. You take a word like big and you compare where it goes to bigger, and then you apply that same vector to a word like small and you get a word like larger. And so we're actually trying to teach Google to learn and to read at, you know, some sort of elementary school level or grade school. Google's 15 years old. It ought to be able to do some of these standardized tests. And it gets to some pretty crazy stuff. So like, you can see this row that has copper. The atomic symbol for copper is CU and then it can interpolate or extrapolate, okay, gold is AU and zinc is ZM. 
And it can kind of learn some crazy things, like Einstein is to scientist as Mozart is to a violinist. So over time, we're getting better and better at doing that sort of deep learning. We're also working on this voice search, so you can say, who is the prime minister of Turkey? Thanks to the knowledge graph, we actually know Turkey is a proper noun. It's actually a, an entity in the world. It should be capitalized. And so you can say, Rekip Tayyip Erdogan is the prime minister of Turkey. But then you can keep going. You can say, how old is he? And we know that you were talking about the prime minister of Turkey from the previous query, and we'll say, okay, he's 59 years old. So Google is trying to figure out answers. We're trying to organize the world's information, make it universally accessible and useful, and actually figure out what is the person exactly asking for. Here's a query I was doing last night. I asked, will it rain tomorrow? And you can tap on the voice search, you can say that, and Google will actually reply back to you. Don't try it right now, but when you get home, just go to Chrome, and you'll notice if you go to Google.com, there's actually a microphone there. And you can click, and you can talk directly to your computer, and it will talk back. So it knows, will it rain tomorrow? It knows my location is in Las Vegas or Paradise, Nevada, and it gives me an answer. But then you can tie that together with conversational search, and you can do a query like, what about Mountain View? All you have to do is say, what about Mountain View for the next query, and it knows you're still looking for the weather. And it says, oh no, it's not going to rain in Mountain View either tomorrow. And then you can keep going, and you can say, how about this weekend? And I encourage you to try these queries out. And it will say, oh, you're talking about how about will it will rain in Mountain View this weekend? And it says, no, on Saturday in Mountain View, it's not going to rain. So we're starting to figure out the structure of what people are actually saying. We're starting to get a little bit better about that and understanding what people are asking for. So <coughs> those are the sort of moonshot changes that we've got going on. I want to start big, and then we'll drill down the quality, then we'll drill down the web spam, then we'll talk about the future going the same way. So one of the big changes that we rolled out in the last few months is a change called Hummingbird. The idea behind Hummingbird is if you're doing a query, it might be a natural language query, and you might include some word that you don't necessarily need, like, uh, what's the capital of Texas, my dear? Well, my dear doesn't really add anything to that query. It would be totally fine if you said just, what is the capital of Texas? Or, what is the capital of ever loving Texas? Or, what is the capital of crazy, rebel, beautiful Texas? Some of those words don't matter as much. And previously, Google used to match just the words in the query. Now we're starting to say which ones are actually more helpful and which ones are more important. And so Hummingbird is a step in that direction where if you are um, you know, saying or typing a longer query, then we're going to figure out which words matter more and give that more intelligence for it. Now, I, there's a lot of articles written about Hummingbird. Like, even when just the code name was known, people were like, OK, how will Hummingbird affect SEO? And even though people don't know exactly what Hummingbird is, they're still going to write 500 words about how Hummingbird affects SEO. And the fact is, it doesn't affect it that much. It affected 90% of queries, but only to a small degree. And we rolled it out for over a month without people even noticing. So it's a subtle change. It's not something that you need to worry about. It's not going to rock your world like Panda or Penguin. It's just going to make the results a little bit better, and especially on those long tail queries or really specific queries, make them much better. So unless you're you know, a spammer and you're targeting you know, how many SEOs does it take to change a light bulb and you've got like all the keywords and you've got 15 variants of it, you've got a page for each one. You know, if you're doing those really long tail things, then it might affect you, but in general, people don't need to worry that much about the number. Uh, another change that we did is we were looking at softening Panda. So there's always people who we think should be affected by Panda and there's sites that we think are really high quality and shouldn't be affected by Panda. And then you have a gray zone. And with that gray zone, you basically have to guess whether a site is high quality or not. And so we found some new signals that basically help us disambiguate that a little bit and move some of the sites that were in the gray zone toward the higher quality area. So softening the effect of Panda in some instances. We've also been looking at detecting the boost in authority. So take uh, medical, for example. If you're an authority in the medical site, in the medical space, we want to be able to know that and start to push you up a little bit higher whenever a medical query comes along. Now, this is not something that's done by hand. It's not like we pick the individual topic areas. It actually applies to thousands of different topic areas. So nothing that you have to do, but if you are a topical authority, keep writing about it, keep developing, keep deepening the amount of content that you have. You really want to be a resource. You do want to be an authority. And if you turn out to be an authority, then you're more likely to be boosted by that particular change. And we've also been working on smartphone ranking. So if you have a, a phone that doesn't do flash, then we're less likely to show you a page that contains Flash, for example. Uh, over time, you might start to think about whether a, uh, a site is slower on smartphones. 
Uh, we've also done ranking changes that say if every single uh, page on the smartphone redirects to the root page, and there's not, you know, you don't get the individual pages, then we might start to rank that lower as well. Okay, so now let's drill down a little bit deeper. Let's talk about web spam changes in the last few months. Penguin 2.0 and 2.1 launched. Um, it was kind of funny because we were working on the next generation of Penguin, which we call Penguin 2.0, and uh, we were trying to get a really soft landing. We wanted something that was, you know, wouldn't set everybody's hair on fire, running around, screaming, and they were crazy, like, oh no, this is horrible, ah! And so Penguin 2.0 launched, and the spammers were actually like, you call that a spam change? That didn't affect me at all! And so a lot of people were, a lot of the Black Hat spam forums were like, oh, that didn't have any impact. And so we were like, okay, well, we can turn that knob a little bit higher. <laughs> and so that's what we did with Penguin 2.1. And, uh, and we're going to keep iterating on those, those kinds of uh, methods of detecting spam so that people don't have the incentive to just, to just create nasty, ugly stuff that doesn't help anybody. The last, say, four to five months, we've also been working on very spammy areas. So think like payday loans in the UK, where you can actually like see the fingerprints of the Russian mafia being involved, this sort of thing. So uh, we've come up with a couple different algorithms. Uh, they don't just apply for a query like payday loan, they'll, they can apply for like mesothelioma and a whole bunch of like spammy areas, car insurance, you know, stuff where there's a lot of tricks that go on, pornographic queries, those sorts of things. Uh, we're gonna keep iterating on that. We're gonna keep trying to improve that. We've also been taking action on advertorials or native advertising. Now, just to be clear, there's nothing wrong with advertorials or native advertising, as long as you market clearly, as long as people know that it's an advertisement. But we've taken action on several dozen newspapers in the US and in the UK where they had paid content that wasn't labeled as paid in any way. It was flowing page rank. It's pretty common sense. We've said it since 2006, like, and probably before that. You shouldn't be paying for links that pass page rank. That's a high risk area, and that applies to advertorials and native advertising, just like it applies to everything else. Uh, and then we continue to, to take action on spam networks. So uh, at one point we were like, okay, maybe we should uh, you know, take a poll about which spam link network should we take down next. But instead we've got a pretty good list and we're just working our way down. Um, I can actually see that we're having a pretty good impact because if you go to random black hat forums, you get comments like this. <laughs> Who wants to punch Matt Cuts in the face? So, anytime I'm being threatened with bodily violence on a Black Hat forum, I know my team is doing their job. Uh, note that this, is, uh, this user is Jason A. This is not Jason. If you guys want to hear about Jason, you have to you know, take some time out of the Q&A and ask about it specifically. Uh, I'm not going to get into that unless people really want to hear about it. So, if the spam are unhappy on the Black Hat forums, then some, you know, not always, but often that's a good signal. We've also been working on communication. I think a lot of people know these things, so I'll cover them relatively quickly. Uh, Miley Oye made a ton of like hours of video in case you've been hacked or to help you with malware. There's a lot of sites that have problems with that. And so we're trying to figure out how we can help people preventively not get hacked or not get malware and then give them a warning and more heads up whenever they do get hacked. Uh, we, we increased the amount of examples that we included in our quality guidelines because a lot of people are like, okay, I understand, you know, maybe you don't want me to pay for links, but are there other examples of spamming links that you could give me? And then the team, there's like, you know, a dozen people. A lot of people, like, want to hear about, okay, what does Matt Cutts say? But there's actually, like, a dozen people at Google who do various types of webmaster communication, right? John Mueller, Pierre Farr, Miley Oye, uh, Zaneb, Gary, there's, there's Wiz, there's Maria, there's a ton of people who go to all kinds of places, you know. They go to Russian search conferences, that's Vladimir uh, or Maria. They go to all sorts of different places. Uh, John Mueller does webmaster office hours. A bunch of different people talk about different topics. So if you want to talk to someone at Google, we try to make that easy. And, uh, and I think if you want to, you know, dial into a webmaster office hours, that's fantastic. We also launched a website this summer called, or earlier this year, called How Search Works. And I, I want to ask, I want you to raise your hand if you've been to the How Search Works website. Okay, so that's, that's a fair number of people, uh, maybe 30%, maybe 25%. But most people in this room have not been to that website. If you're willing to pay hundreds of dollars to come to a search conference, I highly encourage you to come check this out because we actually tell you the categories of spam that we take manual action on. So you can actually see these are the things, the categories that we consider spam. And then we break down 
what are the categories that we take action on the most? So black hat, pure spam, gibberish, auto-generated, just junk, the sort of stuff that you look at it and you immediately know it's spam, that's the number one category. But then you can look down and you can see, oh, I see orange, that orange is the next one. What's that? Oh, that's hacked. It turns out hacked content is the next most common category. So a lot of the stuff that, that you're wondering, where is the web spam team spending its time, you can find those kinds of answers on this website. I highly encourage you to check it out. You can even see live screenshots of spam that we're taking out as we take it out. It's like you're watching over our shoulder as, you, as we're fighting spam. And then we'll even show data like the number of requests, reconsideration requests that we get each week. And so you can find out a lot more information about the volume of data that we process and all that sort of stuff. Okay. So all of that serves to give you an idea of where Google has gone in the last year or so. And from that, you can sort of try to extrapolate where Google's going to go. But why don't I just spell it out for you, the sort of trends that I think are really going to matter. So let's start high level again. Let's start really big. What are the mega trends, the big future trends? One of them is machine learning. Google is going to continue to try to be smarter and smarter. So our mission statement is to organize the world's information and make it universally accessible and useful. That doesn't include the word search engine in there. If we could find ways to solve equations and tell you whether it's going to rain tomorrow and, and extrapolate all kinds of useful information, we're going to try to do that. We're going to keep trying to figure out how to add more value for users and for searchers. Mobile is huge. What do you think these numbers represent? 6%, 25%, 40%. Anybody want to guess? In 2011, YouTube had 6% of its traffic coming from mobile phones. In 2012, YouTube had 25% of its traffic come from mobile phones. In 2013, 40% of YouTube's traffic comes from mobile phones. Mobile is coming faster than anyone expects it. There's a ton of savvy people in this room, and yet, no matter how savvy you are, I think you might be surprised at how quickly mobile is growing. In some countries, mobile traffic has already surpassed desktop traffic. In a ton of other countries, it will surpass desktop traffic in the next one or two years. So if you haven't thought about mobile, if you haven't figured out what your strategy is, if your website looks really sucky on mobile, you want to start thinking about that now. Another big trend is social identity authorship. I think Facebook did a fantastic job of recognizing the value of social and the value of knowing you know, who people are on the web. And if Web spam knew who people were on the web, it would be much easier to keep the spammers out of search results. So things like authorship, things like knowing who you are and identity can make a big difference. Now, a lot of people are like, okay, if I go get a lot of retweets on Twitter or a lot of likes on Facebook or a lot of plus ones on Google Plus, does that mean my ranking will go higher? Tell me, tell me now, is that the signal? Is that what I should be chasing? And my answer is not in the short term, right? It's not the case that we're able to crawl all of Facebook. They block a lot of different pages. It's not the case that we're necessarily able to access every page on Twitter. And it's not the case that plus ones give you a boost in Google's ranking right now. However, in the long term, having good social signals is a reflection of being an authority. It's a reflection of being the sort of person that people listen to. And the, to the degree that social reflects the fact that, it mirrors the fact that you are someone worth listening to, then search engines want to listen to you as well. So don't get it backwards. Don't say, I have to boost up my social so I'll rank higher. Think, I want to be an authority. I want to be someone that people listen to. I want to be an expert so that all those signals that accompany that tell the search engines that, hey, this is someone who should be ranking and ranking well. Okay, let's drill down a little bit deeper. Web spam trends. It's going to look, for the next six months, like web spam's not doing much. I'm just going to tell you that right now. We're going to be working on things that most people won't see. So hacking remains one of the big areas that we haven't yet tackled. We've, well, we've tackled, but we're working on the next generation of hacking detection. Uh, so if you do a query like by Viagra, it's still spammy. I'll be happy to admit that. It's still spammy because there are people willing to do illegal things and hack websites. We're working on that. We're trying to figure out the next generation so that we can catch that and make sure that those guys, the people who are willing to do those illegal things, not just Black Hat, but like would go to prison Black Hat, uh, are not going to succeed. It will take a little bit of time, but we're going to keep working on it. We've also been working on um, some, some really hot topics internationally, things like child sexual abuse imagery. Because I started out on web spam because I was working on Safe Search, I still get pulled in every so often whenever there is something that we need to work on improving. 
And we want to make sure that if you type really nasty queries, you do not find